Hello and welcome to the last event in my Writing Is series. This is Writing Is Publishing. I am the writer in residence at Maynooth University um, and that is supported by Maynooth University and also Kildare Library and Arts Services and in peace times it's usually based on campus at the English department at Maynooth University but we've been remote like much of the rest of the world. Um, I want to get some thank yous out of the way while I remember. I'd like to thank Una Frawley, I'd like to thank um, Lucinda Russell, Tracy O'Flaherty for the tech, and also my fellow writer in resident Nathan O'Donnell. I couldn't hope for a, a better partner in crime, for want of a better word. Um, Nathan has been looking at experimental publishing while I've been focusing on experimental um, writing and practice. So tonight's event is brought to you in line of duty style by the letter H. Um, John Holton is a novelist, artist and occasional curator. His first novel, The Ready Mades, was published in 2011 by Broken Dimanche Press, which he co-founded in Berlin in 2009. It was followed up by Oslo, Norway in 2015. Uh, John has collaborated with many visual artists on texts and publications in recent years and he has been awarded literature bursaries from the Arts Council of Ireland most recently in 2017. David and Ping Hem Henningham live and work in Dalston, London. They write essays and poetry that are completed and reworked through fine art printmaking, bookbinding and performance. David and Ping formed the Henningham Family Press in 2006 to make art together. Collections that have been that have acquired their work include the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Tate, um, Cesson Poetry Library at the Royal Festival Hall, Hall, UCL, Chelsea College of Art and UCLA. They have exhibited and performed at Christie's Auction House, Multiplied, um, Royal Academy Summer Exhibition, the British Library, BBC Radio Theatre, Dundee Contemporary Arts, the Whitechapel Gallery, Black Rack, Black, Black Rat Gallery, London Word Festival, Berlin, Ghent, Oslo, Bergen, Indiana, and Virginia. So I brought you two guys, uh, two presses together, sorry, I should say, uh, for a number of reasons, um, not least being that you write as well, um, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, I was digging around and found a lovely statement from Henningham Family Press that I'm going to share um, that, um, and then um, manifesto from Broken Dimanche, which I think will set the tone for tonight. So um, you've written that Hen Henningham Family Press is a collaborative art and writing of David and Ping Henningham, which I've already mentioned. We are both artists and authors. We are curious about every aspect of writing, printing and publishing. We complete and represent our writing through fine art, printmaking, bookbinding and performance. Books and prints are machines for communicating ideas and ideas that fascinate us tend to involve money, history and religion. And this is the line I really love. We exploit the fact that reading makes the dead available for comment. And I might ask you to explain that. Um, we make live shows that bring our books and ideas to life. That's Henningham Family Press statement. So Broken to Monch are very much a publisher after my own heart. They issued a manifesto back in the early days. Um, and I'll read a couple of points. Um, I um, always have a soft spot for manifestos. This one's especially playful. But OK, point um, one point one. The avant-garde and experimental, the poetic and intellectual are being denigrated and sidelined because publishing is not commercial enough in its current state. The lowest common denominator is the only one getting paid. Uh, the book offers writers or literature a fruitful domain for experimenting with words and the book in turn can be treated as an exhibition space itself. 2.1, to decide to make physical books, one must do so to the highest possible standards. Form matters, content matters, design and production matter. 2.2, we continually want to reinvent the book. 
2.2.1, we put ISBNs on everything if we term it to be a book. John, um, Henningham Family Press, I suppose your name's self-explanatory, but John, could you explain to those who don't know where the name Broken Dumont Press comes from? Sure. Um, I think the easiest way was I was living with my then girlfriend, uh, the Norwegian journalist Lena madsen Siemenstad, on Sonntagstrasse in, in Berlin, Sunday Street, which is a, which is a pretty name. And... Um, yeah, it also just happened to be the name uh, Dimanche uh, Sunday it was the uh, one day newspaper by Yves Klein that he put out in the 50s, which I'd always loved and admired. And our initial idea was we would kind of make more journalism, more newspapers, uh, which we never, we, it took us years before we made our first newspaper. But yeah, Broken Dimanche, I, I, it was going to be Dimanche Press, but um, I wanted to kind of shake things up and I liked <laughs> And I just stuck on Broker Dimanche uh, Press at the last minute to kind of evoke that uh, iconoclastic uh, hope that we had uh, back uh, back at the beginning. So then it just stuck. And uh, yeah, like any name, it's kind of, it was uh, funny, but, uh, you know, difficult to, to come up with. Um, David, um, we were just talking beforehand um, about the first and last time we met. Um, and um, last time I saw you in person was in the former Conservative Club in Paddington and you were singing with a parsnip in your mouth. Do you want to explain that? How much does performance um, um, yeah, how much performance do you um, include in, in, in your publishing? Yeah, so to explain the parsnip in the mouth, um, there was uh, there was the, an evening's event, an evening's entertainment put on by um, David Collard, the uh, broadcaster now, I suppose, and the uh, critic, who um, wanted to make an alternative to um, Bloomsday, but for Finnegan's Wake. So uh, um, he had an evening of. Um, readings and discussion and cabaret essentially based cabaret around... fin Finnegan yeah. <laughs> like cabaret Voltaire but Finnegan yeah it was cabaret <laughs> Finnegan um and uh, they I was asked to sing the ballad of Percy O'Reilly um which I went away and Julie worked out how to do and then sang it um only afterwards did people come up to me and say that's unsingable how did you do it <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> um but at one point um there was a a, a line about fusiliers um, and so I wanted something I could bite the pin out of and throw. And uh, one of the ways of distracting people from the fact it couldn't be sung was to throw things around. And I, uh, the parsnip allowed me to shout with a funny accent because I had my mouth full. Um, so that, that, was a, that was good. Um, performance is a huge part of what we do. And we, we've, we've been working for years on a process we call performance publishing. Do you want to um, grab the maximum wage? Already, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, so let's talk about performance, yeah. Well, I mean, I think partly it's, um, we have to remember, we come from a background of being artists. Um, so we're trained as artists and we, we come from a background of kind of visual arts. Um, and so when we first started the press, it was very much about finding a place to put kind of our you know visual arts finding yeah. place to exhibit similar to we, we david has taken a note here book as exhibition space john <laughs> um and um so we for many years we didn't publish um what we would call kind of um what we call mass publishing so trade books we wouldn't publish books which were like novels that go into bookshops for example we mainly did art books and we did a thing which we made them through a process which we call performance publishing which is when we were just basically it was kind of the beginning was live printing so we started yeah. off uh, we had a chip shop where we um we made a chip shop counter and we um printed individual words oh there's a couple of chips under this we're in our we're in our studio at the moment so we can keep pulling stuff out as long as we don't knock ourselves out it's quite cramped in here i, I hope you there? know i just tried it um, oh look here we go so we did a thing where we printed on chipboard and um, this work was, we printed this on the radio when we were on BBC Radio 3 in the radio theatre. Oh, this yeah. work was chosen by um, uh, Melvin Bragg, the poet, the poet laureate. Simon, Simon Armitage. Simon Armitage, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's the 
that's a piece by the poet laureate there. Um, so um, we, uh, yeah. So, so we started. Um, yeah. So that was that was kind of printing individual words, and then um, we were also at the same time making books. And I think basically, eventually, it leads to this project, which is called the Maximum Wage. Oh, wrong side. Sorry, Maximum Wage. And this is a, a magazine that we made kind of documenting the maximum wage after it happened. Um, and what happened with maximum wage was we were simultaneously generating the content for the publication at the event which the publication was about. Does that, does yeah, that make so, sense to you? So, so, that, so at the event we had about 300 people come in and we in the centre of the room we had a thing that looked a bit like a game show and a printing press at the same time and what happened was we 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 um, stimulated discussion around a theme of employment and money wage disparity and then we um, were able to with a whole team of artists create a series of publications on the spot with the people who were doing the event and then distribute them on the day so what i'm showing here now is us at the event doing some live printing what we were printing that day was money we were printing it was a show about money and um wage poverty and what um, what does it mean to um wage kind of values in society and inequality um so we were printing money and we were creating a bank which there was money which they could spend at various things during the venue and we also had a as, we, as I am David said, we had a team of artists. This is a team here. We had a team of artists. Um, woo, sorry, I'm having trouble with my high tech screen here. Um, uh, so one good example is the ladies of the press here. They generated a zine on the day, which was updated continually. And when people made contributions, they'd print one out and give them to one of the participants. So the whole idea of like a performance publishing event is that you're taking the whole process of creating ideas, laying them out, printing them, and distributing them all within a few hours on the spot. So you do it all with one audience. That's sort of how it works. Actually, Ping, yeah, so here's a Ping. I'm glad. I'm glad you're having trouble. I'm glad you mentioned yeah. money because um, why on earth did both of you set up a publishing press? Surely it's the easiest way to lose money. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the famous joke. Is uh, how you make, yeah. a million, make a million dollars in publishing? Yeah, you start yeah. Off for two. yeah. You start off for two million. I mean, it's true. I think uh, publishing is is a, a very strange business uh, to think about in in economic terms. Also, just because of the realities of distribution and how the whole system works, also right the way up to bookshops. Uh, but and also when I started, uh, I think which is just a few years after you guys, uh, Amazon, uh, you know, Amazon, the ebook, uh, the, the, the threat of Kindle was, was really in the air. It was like kind of that and Twitter, uh, you know, BBC, BBC Radio would do these live panel discussions from like Twitter conventions. Anyway, but uh, yeah, and the, that kind of didn't really happen. But um, yeah, but the. The, the way one way out of it for at least for me was just to uh decide never to actually worry about making money <laughs> so you just embrace uh brace that and 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 carry on i think one of the things we do is um we just try not to lose money we've actually always made money we've always made money but the thing is we don't <laughs> we're not aiming to make money I mean, if you want to make money don't start a press you know um, but what we try and do <laughs> is we aim not to lose money. So it was that we we kind of based our accounts on um, Leonard and um, what's her name, Virginia, Virginia. Woolf. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ping, Ping so, wrote a fantastic essay uh, called "A Press of One's Own," which I think you can still find on. Oh, I'd like to check that out. Yeah, but, which yeah, it's very. Um, I mean, I, I spent yeah. a lot of time reading all of Leonard Woolf's diaries and things, and basically what he said was. We just tried not to lose money. We just yeah. tried to break even. And they actually did very well in the end, kind of accidentally, and also partly because of the war, actually. Um, but that's one of the things that we just try and do. Try not to lose money, mm -hmm. try to break even, and then you might yeah. be able to make a little bit. And also, we one of the problems with books is that they are, um, especially children's books, are very depressed in the amount of money which people pay for them. Um, we, from an art background, have other ways that well, we've, we've never um we've always made money because we have things like so um let's this one yeah 
yeah, Mr. Beethoven there. Mr. Beethoven. So, um, yeah, so um, we've got the, so we have paperbacks which go into high street bookshops and online and they're globally distributed. Um, and so we make, so this is Mr. Beethoven by Paul Griffiths. And it was in the Goldsmiths Prize and all sorts of the Walter Scott Prize. And so it's a, a normal book, you know, and it's printed um, litho, that's the shop, there you go. Um, and we print our own covers in the studio. So we have a printing press over here. Um, so we actually, that's a foil debossing press. It's like this. Yeah, that, that puts gold on things. And so we actually, because we print our own covers and we have an annex where we have our board chopper and so on, we can make handmade editions. We can actually make um, a sensible amount of money for a book edition. The same pages that we print for, with a printer for the paperback are the ones which are inside a deluxe version of the book. So this is bound by hand. There's a couple more in the laying press over there at the moment. Um, so this is bound by hand and it's got colour inserts. So it's an artist book version of the same book. Um, and so this one is £80. Um, this one is £12.99. So having those different streams means that we're able to um, do that. And like we other one-off books you know we, we made a book with Victoria Bean and that was sold to Stanford University for about well for a few thousand dollars you know <laughs> so standard trade book deluxe yeah so this one the front cover was made by shaping the paper around a brick um to make this kind of all thick so we make a little bit more money on the artist books because yeah. I mean essentially because we're being paid as artists to make the book so you know you get paid a little bit more but um you can't you cannot count up the hours that are spent editing promoting yeah that's a book that's and not, yeah. be, i mean i'm john you must know you don't get paid for any of that do you, you well, i mean the arts council <laughs> the arts council of england um support us uh, on a few of these books um sophie hertz i'm 60 lovers to make and do and and uh yeah, so that one, that's an Arts Council supported Trade. book. Trade. Deluxe. Deluxe. <laughs> <laughs> the nice. cover for that's actually made out of her dress. So she had this dress at the reading and she had off cuts from that. And then we, um, oh, it just goes off, doesn't it? It's, really hard. it's the opposite to what you think. It's the opposite <laughs> to what you think. And then it's the opposite to that. Um, and uh, you get to, and then Deadless as well, which is in progress. Um, Deadless is the sequel to Ulysses. It's set the day after Bloomsday by Chris McKay. Trade. So I trade. had a yeah, I had a and copy. The deluxe of that, one is in but, progress. Um, so. Yeah, I had a copy of Deadless, but it was holiday. Uh, I think it, oh. it was. I took it on holiday, and then it, I was trying to finish it in Bantry, and um, Bernard McCleverty came along, and he said, "Oh, what are you reading?" And he appropriated it from me. So, <laughs> but um, John. And you yeah. play with um, um, you, your books. Um, you mentioned in your manifesto about if, if um, you put an ISBN on what you consider, but you play with form as well. Um, yeah. um, you've printed on beer bottles before. Yes. And yeah. I mean it's something that uh, I kind of went on a bit of a journey. So I went from uh, thinking that okay, we should just do a have a have a, a standard form format. So uh, inspired very much by um, uh, like some of some of the French presses that I've always admired, like Edition de Minuit or, 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 or so on. And what had then became one of my favorite UK small publishers, Fitzcarraldo. They they also took uh, the same inspiration, but actually we only did uh, uh, three books in the same size. Uh, and then my graphic designers kind of convinced me to, and quite quickly it kind of became a thing where artists also wanted to express their own kind of desires. So actually then we ended up kind of going in the total opposite direction where it was like, um, yeah, we, our, each book started to take its own shape. 
organic tree. I also like got back in those days, I got like a hundred ISBNs for, 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 for cheap, you know, bulk buy. And I was like, yeah, let's just burn through this and, and start putting ISBNs on different things. So we did some ex effectively what were ex exhibitions, but we would like put an ISBN on like Lorenzo Sandoval would build uh, an artist, Spanish artist would build a kind of a presentation machine that he would call a, a, a narrative machine that had an ISBN and the beer bottle edition. Um, we had something called the Cacophony 2, which we did a, a, a 10 copies. That was our in-house kind of journal. Uh, and that always took quite radically different different shape. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically just to kind of go in. And again, it was at that moment, this idea that the the, the Kindle was going to somehow take over and and that books had this existential threat looming over them. And then, the, you know, it was the exact same year that the, the art or years where artist books really became a, a massive and artist presses became a massive force. Printed matter kind of came into the picture and you could go to the fair. That is that the bookshop had been around for the 70s, but you could go to this fair and, and basically, you know, thousands of, of New York hipsters would, would turn up and it would be a, it would be like a rock festival, you know, and um, <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's been a good, good time for books actually for what we're doing. Uh, is is, is yeah. that something that haunts you, the, the threat of, of digital or is it a threat anymore? Um, is it a challenge? Like, um, cause both presses, um, as I mentioned, uh, they're almost like, they're, they're beautiful objects. Um, would you consider them sculptures? I don't know, but it, yeah. not that, that. <laughs> it, it's not, it's yeah. not um, style over content. They're, you know, designed ultimately to be read. Um, hmm. But uh, did the threat of digital Keep your wake up. Digital, digital isn't, I wouldn't, I don't see digital as a threat because if you look at the whole chain of how books are produced, um, digital means that you can now, the printer can now print straight onto a sheet of aluminium for doing the printing process. So that's now got cheaper and cleaner. You can edit a book digitally, proof it digitally, and send it. So that's all got cheaper. Um, you now have HB Indigo presses, which are digital presses that have existed for about all about seven years. You talking about is, the digital format? Well, but, I, but I, I know that is the digital format. I'm coming to that. Yeah. So I think so. I think that all, overall, when you balance out all the effects of digital, digital has in the, has made so much more possible. Um, even for doing like the things that we show, which are beautiful objects, a lot of that would not have been possible. I mean, yeah, digital does without. make a lot of printed matter so the, possible. But yeah. with ebooks, the thing with ebooks is they're invented to prevent things being competitive. That the the, the e ePub files were invented to prevent digital changing books. It's kind of simulating a printed book. You can't share it very easily. Yeah. Um, and doesn't it just drive you wild when you borrow an ebook from the library that you end up in a line of 27 people? Yeah. I mean, like they yeah. could just easily give it to all of you at the same time. Exactly. But they don't. Yeah, exactly. It, it is. It's really it's really a uh, good point. I mean, that's the funny thing. Like there, it's a cliche, but the, bar, the book is a remarkably smart and resilient technology that's, you know, done, done a lot for for us as, as a species and as societies. Yeah, it's been around a while here. And yeah, just that example with the, the book queue, it's, uh, it is often, we're trying to, it's trying to ape and copy what books do already. Um, so yeah, I think that they're, they're really good points. I mean, it does get interesting when it comes to what does it mean? I mean, it's very, I've seen recently that the, Gu the Guardian celebrating its 200 years and they still, their journalists are still laughing that people get upset when their review is not in the print edition, but only online, even though there's like 69 million people can can access it online, do access the Guardian digitally. And only, you know, a couple of thousand basically would read the review section in print edition. Uh, and it's a prestige thing, you know, so it's, it's, so it's all sorts of things. Even I have that as a writer, you know, I would prefer to be printed in a, in a, in a print edition of a, of a journal uh, than, than their online only section, you know. And, Actually, uh, um, I wanted to ask you um, about being a writer. D does it inform your practice as publishers or does publishing um, inform your practice as a writer? Um, or 
does it at all? Does, does that make sense? Sure. I mean, maybe I, I can go first on that one. I mean, it's a really good question. I think mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a lot of things that that uh, that kind of that I could look at that question by by. But I think no, my I was definitely be more interested in my relationship with visual art. So like it's right there with Eve, Eve's Klein. Uh, it was like very much inspired by artists taking on the initiative, so so to speak, of publishing themselves or of uh, disseminating their work uh, in a, like immediate way and not waiting around for for some series of gatekeepers to to push them through. So I think as a as a publisher, I'd be more inspired by visual art practice. Uh, historically, uh, it's only been more recently that I got interested in, in writer, literary writers who self-published themselves um, through, through the years. I also didn't know anything about publishing from a business point of view, uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, and then as a writer, I think the list that I have with Broken Demand Press is, I hope, in somehow reflective of the literature that I like to to align myself with, of course. Um, but not 100%. It's not like a straight up literary publishing house. Yeah. You, Hanningham, I think, Family Press. I think that, yeah, I think that when, when um, I mean, when I went to, the, I went to art college to study sculpture um, and that was from a point when I was thinking, should I study English and become a writer or, I wanted to learn to compose things more generally. Um, and uh, um, you studied art. That's how we met, studying art together, but you wanted I to I did do... history of art because I thought I might do more writing. But then when we finished, I was like, I don't ever want to write again. <laughs> so I've written I've written for us as a press. I don't really do that much for my, for my own writing. Whereas yeah. David does much more kind of, so he's been, you know, got an all that and stuff. I think it makes yeah. us kinder to our writers in some way. When we're, the editing process, I think quite a few of our writers have commented that the editing process with us mm. is quite I, gentle. Yeah. I think basically it gives you other options and it means that we're, we're usually not using a set of kind of creative writing rules, rules mm. to edit some things. I mean, Daedalus comes to mind with, um, so Chris McCabe wrote the, wrote the story um, and he had okay. some notes, he had some notes to explain what he was writing. And um, we ended up write, creating this kind of visual art, art aspect to it, a set of vitrines, which are in a kind of imaginary um, Joyce museum. Um, and it also linked it to the contemporary setting a bit more. So we had a kind of, that gave us an alternative to editing his text just as a text you know so it, it it offers a way of collaborating with people is a, probably the best way of putting it i think so um you know writing has, has become one plank of something which is also to do with sculpture and visual art you know it's another way of, of putting that um yeah um, and uh i think also and whenever and when it, and so with my own and so with my own writing like the novel i've just written um i try i i'm trying to write as a sculptor as well you know it's that that way of composing things and layering things is part of it a bit like brian catling who is a sculptor and an author i know. think one of the things that um we've noticed is that we tend to work with people from who cross a lot of disciplines mm, just like yeah. we do because i think one of the i mean i think every when you when you start a press one of the main things you have to think about and also as a writer sending your stuff to a publishing house you have to think about what niche they're in because everyone's in these tiny niches we're all in you know everyone is a specialist in a little area if you try and publish too many different things having said that we do do that <clears throat> but let's just, <laughs> we'll just move on from that um, but if you try and do too many things you can't do well so one of the things that we do well we hope is we put out literature which is um experimental and exciting and one of the reasons why we can do that is because we have a lot of specialisms in the house, as it were, because we've, between us, we cover a lot of subjects. We come from different backgrounds from your usual creative writing. So we're able to edit things from history, from 
visual arts from you know all kinds of things I think that's part of just that's just sort of part of artistic practice in general yeah. it's a really good idea to always have lots of different influences coming you know kind of follow following your instincts to those different directions at the moment I'm doing a lot of music as in classical music as in harmony and counterpoint and Bach and stuff and I'm sure it's going to lead us somewhere yeah, yeah I'm definitely claiming it for tax anyway <laughs> <laughs> David, you mentioned your novel there. Could I um, invite you to read from it, maybe, and if you want to contextualise yeah. it, or, or if you don't, sure, yeah. mine as well. Yeah, so I should say, so the novel is called um, Foulness, and um, it's about a, uh, it's set on an island off the Essex coast where the um, MOD own the island, have been using it to test weapons um, for about for a hundred years. Um, so pe the weapons were fired onto the sandbanks which are exposed at low tide when the Thames recedes. It's a real island. It's a real, it's a real place and right. there's, a, um, there's, a farm, there's, there's a farming community that's still there and has been there the whole time and it has its own very sort of distinct identity. Um, so it's a fascinating place. You go through the barbed wire and the checkpoints and then you reach a village. It's weird. Um, so my story is set uh, in the 50s at the end of the, at the beginning of the Cold War um, and uh, it's going to be published by Unbound um, who we've been collaborating with um, on our other books but then they've taken my novel so there's some crossover between us. This um, bit is from um, a bit where the narrator James has gone sailing with a sergeant called Atheling, who he's not been getting on with, um, and he's been roped into helping him with something. The shore was crazed with networks of trenches carved into the mud by nothing more than seawater and gravity. Wooden stakes jutted out of the sombre mud like abandoned stilts, sodden black and rounded as a ford. A road disappeared into the water and reappeared on the mainland behind us. We raised our centreboard to a quivering minimum and glided over the submerged Ozy Road. What is it about these people who won't accept the limits described by the sea? Are they mesmerised by the tides? In a million years time, the people of the Dengue Hundred will be amphibious. As we slouched in the bottom of the boat, a broad inlet opened in the river Blackwater's northern bank. Athling aimed for it, swinging the boom with its indolent mainsail slowly overhead. Goldhanger Creek, that would do nicely. We threaded through the few little cruisers that were moored to buoys in the creek mouth. He turned into the wind as the creek suddenly narrowed, slowing us down. You did well, he said, reaching into his faded overalls and pulling out a slender green New Testament in the Psalms, with its pages closed around a white-tipped pencil. He slapped my chest jovially with it, now for your part of the bargain. As soon as my hand closed around it, he stood up and began lowering the mainsail. We've got until it turns, the current will help us on our way out. He glanced over the side, then reached into the water to pluck a bit of sea grass from the shimmering shallow creek. Lovely with a nice bit of fish. He popped it in his mouth. I tried some too and found it to be very salty. Its pale roots pulled out from the soft mud as easily as a shoe from a boot. I found a passage and passed the book back. Let's try a psalm, I said. He sat on the transom and began to read. He only is my rock and my salvation. Yes, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Right? This was almost pleasant, drifting in the creek myself lounging in the bottom of the boat, listening to Athling read, On God rests my deliverance on my honour, and my honour, and my honour, my mighty... Christ! cursed Athling, snapping the book shut. In the quiet we heard the high-pitched wooden percussion of his pencil falling and rolling in the bottom of the boat. It's getting worse, he said quietly. Not a patient man. He flexed the tiny Bible as if it were a railway timetable and looked away towards feathery rushes that seemed to flick sparkling ripples onto the water when the wind brushed them. It isn't, sir. He waved the psalms at me as if they were exhibit A. 
now mixing up my words on my honour. Bloody hell. And I've been practising. I leaned on a centreboard case and sat up, tipping the boat slightly. That's nothing to be worried about, sir, I said, gesturing for the book to be handed over. See? I picked up the pencil and pointed with it. You got distracted by a big word and made a guess. Just take your time and try not to guess. Come on. I said, handing the book back on the correct page. You're a soldier for Pete's sake. There was a moment's consideration. That I am, he said. All right then. He coughed. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Good, I said. Remember, break the big words down and take your time. He pressed the glossy white tip of his pencil under the next line. How long will you settle upon a man to shatter him? They take per pleasure. Pleasure in falsehood. He looked up. See, that's what I mean. He tapped the offending scripture. A rotten, complicated word. Why can't they write words how they sound? I won't argue with you there. It's humiliating is what it is. Who else is having to do this at my age? I looked away, thinking. Got you there, he said. Give me one example. I caught sight of the gold legend printed on his pencil. Beryl, by royal appointment. You know your Vikings and the rest, I said, pointing beyond the creek mouth. Alfred the Great. He ordered his veterans to learn to read. The sergeant cocked his head, thought for a moment, and then accepted the example. I, he did. He seemed proud of the association. I was pleased with myself. He was a Saxon mine, not a Viking. I know that, I went on. He sent English Bibles to his battle-scarred thanes with jeweled pointers engraved like your pencil. Alfred ordered me be maimed. made. Yes, sir, said Atheling, half concealing a schoolboy smirk. Come on then, I huffed. Let's pick up where we left off. Atheling straightened his back as if on parade. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. Tracing words again with his pencil, it really did feel like I was floating with King Alfred and his coracle, musing over his battered bead. Trust in him at all times, O oh people. Easy for him, though. Even words have a half-life now. Countermeasures, counter-countermeasures. We floated idly. It would be a good long time before the current began to pull us towards the creek now. Men of low estate are but a breath. Men of high estate are a delusion. Thank you, David. And when when is that out with on so the the book is um, currently crowdfunding on Unbound. It's Unbound slash Books slash Founess F O U L N E S S, and um, we've got handmade editions with slip cases that are going to be made in the studio. We've got the paperback. Um, and that's crowdfunding now if people want to um, get on board. Confusingly, <laughs> when we're not publishing it. It's yeah, Unbound. It's Unbound, yeah. You'll find it on Unbound.com. It's, uh, it's one of those funny things. I was saying to David, because one of the problems is if you self-publish, you end up automatically unable to go in for lots of prizes. So I was just saying to David, like one of the best things you could probably do as a young writer is start a publishing press and get your friend to start a publishing press and then just publish each other. <laughs> Publish each other into the prizes. Very, you know. Yeah, that sounds like the Irish model, all right. Um, <laughs> John, you're John. You're going to read from a work in progress. Yes, uh, yes. it would be my pleasure. Uh, thanks for that, David. Um, so I've written, I've published, written and published two novels with Broken Image Press. Uh, it was always going to be a, a not a trilogy as such, but a, oh yeah, there we go, the first One edition. Um, a, a Roman flew of uh, a kind of strange sequence of, of books that would have the same uh, characters and generally speaking it's about the end of the world and I guess love and it's called Ranyarok the overall uh, project um, this novel I've been writing for around four years I, I finished the drafts of it like over a year ago but I had to go back and rewrite the whole thing uh, it's proving a bit bit tricky i don't even have really a title for it it's going to be called the trains of europe and then maybe nine worlds of yesterday i don't know what it'll be called but i'm playing with something i call like the idea of effective or vection in, in fiction which is the sense you have on a stationary train when a train beside you is pulling out um 
you feel like you're moving, but actually you're you're staying still. So I'm trying to explore that what that would look like uh, in storytelling. So basically, what that means is I, I tell the story backwards. And this is so the first reading from the first chapter, or potentially the last chapter. Uh, then it, it is actually something that you would read at the end of the book, and. We the chapter is quite simple. It's 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 a train ride from Hamburg to Berlin, uh, with with the, the characters approaching at uh, a boyfriend and girlfriend, the main protagonists of the story approaching Berlin, and during the train ride they're, they're kind of talking and joking back and forth. Uh, the the main character the, the male character is an engineer, and the female character is uh, uh, a, a doctor or a medical student. On, on a kind of uh, sabbatical and they're joking playfully and I somehow try and want to tell the story of the trains of Europe uh, in their conversation so you'll get a little snippet of the conversation and then a little part of, of my telling of the history and I'm obviously because it's interested in the end of end of things end of the world it's also interested in evil I guess and yeah you'll see that trains in, in Europe result in all sorts of good and, and bad things so it starts with with some dialogue. Uh, you know, whatever about the war, everything can be explained by trains, William says. Is that so? She leans her head back and asks sardonically, is that why you always want to travel by train? You want the world explained to you? Well, he says, trains gave us the First World War. They allowed America to connect its coasts. Stanford was a railroad man. His money gave us the university with his name on it. And that gave us Silicon Valley, the internet. I mean... It's thanks to trains we discovered the second law of thermodynamics, and that basically really does explain everything. And what, she is smiling and frowning at once, pray tell, is the second law of thermodynamics. Actually, forget that. What the hell is the first law of thermodynamics? Heat cannot be created nor destroyed because it's energy. Oh, whatever. Strange man, you are boring, boring me, she says, but is smiling all the same. There is a pause. They look at each other and he smiles and looks away first, out the window, at the land rushing away, past and out of sight. The second law, he says somewhat triumphantly, states that heat will always move from an area where it is ordered to a place where it will be disordered. In an isolated system, entropy will always increase. And what the hell has this got to do with trains? Oh, he looks a little disappointed. Well, it was thanks to trains that we discovered this. Everyone knows something of the Holocaust, and yet not everyone knows the same things. The trains of Europe were to be put to ever darker uses. The Deutsche Reichsbahn Gesellschaft, or DRG for short, may have considered itself a political, a service, and technically driven organization, but in fact, it was always directed by forces of contemporary society and politics. The Nazi party had, upon its creation, been no fan of the DRG, calling it the Dawes Railway, in control of American stockholders and Wall Street Jews. Before coming to power in 1933, the Nazis infiltrated the railroads as best they could. And while many railroaders remained technicians and wanted to leave everything else to the politicians, there is no doubt, contrary to what some have claimed in subsequent years, that the DRG was coordinated, like every other aspect of German society, and by extension large parts of soon-to-be-occupied European society, around the goals of the Nazi project. The dark, tentacled reach of the network begins to slowly groan with horror. Upon Hitler becoming Chancellor, the Fachschaft Reichsbahn was formed by the Nazis, and this infiltrated the organization and demanded the removal of Jews and left-wing personnel. The DRG refused, and so other means of pressure, including physical intimidation by the SA and street protests outside the headquarters of the DRG on Berlin's Vossstrasse were deployed. By 1934, the board was overhauled. Jews were retired or forced out. Members of the SA, SS, and Nazi party members were all hired or promoted ahead of others. It's always worth remembering that no matter how irrationally racist the Nazis were and inhumane Hitler and other top officials like Himmler and Heidegger were, the febrile hate and evil unleashed by them was matched by a society that was literate, functional, technical. An example of this can be seen by the top railroader by this time, the trains of Germany were run by a man called Julius Dorpmuller, a heavy set man in his 60s who had lived his entire life inside the railway system. His father had been a railroad engineer, and after studying railroad engineering himself, Julius went to the German colony of Tsingtao in Asia and worked on the Chinese railways until 1918. Described by the historian Mirjuzhiski as a, quote, 
one-dimensional man interested only in running trains, end quotes, end quote, a lifelong bachelor who was married, as if, as it were, to the railway himself, railway system itself, quote, Dort Muller lived in a world filled with locomotives, trains and tracks. Everything else was extraneous. His acceptance of the view that the Reichsbahn should serve the government of the day unreservedly made the railway vulnerable to exploitation by the Nazi regime, end quote. The years before the Second World War saw the trains become increasingly part of the racist state, serving the common good, no matter that this meant a common criminality. And this was its expected service. Hitler called it, quote, the most progressive transportation enterprise in the world. Not for the first time we have the word progressive, when in fact we could just as easily swap it out for aggressive. There had been a compromise. The organization morally vacated itself and conformed to the Nazi ideology, and in return, it was allowed to happily control its own operations. So by early 1939, Dorp Muller was caught out by war. He had not been informed of the plans, but that is not to say that there wasn't cooperation between the DRB and the army. As rearmament had gathered pace, so the expansion of the network followed suit, but not without shortcomings and a willful allocation of resources. The train network was taken for granted so much by the Nazis and as, such, and as such was ignorant of the carnage about to be unleashed on the world. It would not be able to continue to serve as both civilian and military needs from September 1939. The latter was to take precedence. And so the story of the trains of Europe finds itself back at war. And while the change brought about to humanity by train travel can be stressed, can't be stressed enough, in ways one can easily forget or simply never have thought about these changes. For example, the unification of a global timing system, the colonization of large parts of the world by the brute laying down of wooden sleepers and iron rail, even the cushioning of seats for comfort, the ability to read while traveling and the advent of the paperback novel, all of this thanks to railways. It is the large scale movement of aggressors and victims during the, during the years 1939 to 1945 that should be dwelt upon for a moment. Thank you, John. Um, so with this novel, Trains of Europe, and I'm glad you mentioned Europe, um, I'll to ask you about that in a second, but um, you're hoping to publish out of house like David is doing. It's not gonna be a broken Dimanche title. No, I, I don't. I mean, I don't know. The point that I think that what I, I think it's worth stressing, I guess, about self-publishing is that it gives a lot of freedom. Um, I guess my problem is I'm a bit impatient in general in life. And I think that's why I first published myself. I just didn't want to try and go through the the the, the route of getting agent representation and, and in London. And so that just just felt very strange to go back to the UK. Uh, or goes to the UK where I've never even lived or, or I guess to Dublin I just decided to do it myself so writing this strange story that's told backwards that has this extended kind of cadenza at the end about the history of the <laughs> European train network as you've just heard is kind of uh, strange in, in its kind of interests uh, and the scope of how it's trying to tell them that I'm like not worrying about who would publish it I am really interested in Unbound and this, this methodology of, of funding books and finding the readership in advance. I think it's really interesting and, and, and something that like I would look at. But the plans for Broken Dimanche Press are, are a lot more back in line with what I was saying earlier about having a, a, a similar imprint. So that I'm going to kind of uh, have similar seeming books in the future. That would be very much uh, more easily managed. Um, a bit like uh, the Henningham's, uh, the, those, the difference between those, yeah. those titles that get into bookshops and, and then special editions. Yeah, I think um, most yeah. of the things that, most of the things that, that my, you know, both of our writing that we have published, almost everything has been self-published, you know, so in a sense, the, one of the main reasons for wanting to do this with Unbound was because we hadn't done it before, but it's, it's an exploring, so it's that compulsion to explore different methods of publishing that meant we ended up doing that with John Mitchinson and Unbound, and what John just said there was really hitting the nail on the head, and thought it'd be worth pointing out that this idea of finding an audience for the book before, as you're bringing it out, that's something that we've been very interested in for years, like a lot of small presses, 
you know, with performance publishing, you're bringing the audience together and making it with the audience. So they're invested in it, interacting with it. Um, it's one way of getting an audience. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also uh, this whole idea, this whole idea of like what happens with a lot of those big publishers, especially, is they publish a book and then they don't really get round to marketing it. You know, they'll do a tweet. Um, and uh, with the Unbound model, one of the most powerful things about it is it encourages you to make sure that you do the actual finding the audience for the work. Um, at the beginning. At the beginning. Yeah, at the front of the process. We, I mean, we'll like this, not, we, you, if you put it off, if you put something off, you just end up not doing it. And, and essentially, like you were saying, John, about... Um, publishing not being commercial enough great point i thought you know this this sort of manifesto point about um how the lowest common denominator works and this idea of not properly monetizing the other layers of publishing is a really good point um that if you don't set yourself a deadline as they are with finding an audience you just end up not doing it because yeah. unfortunately finding the audience bit is not the exciting part the exciting part is the work yeah. Yeah. well that's the thing like the you haven't really we haven't touched on distribution and I always like to bring it up when talking about publishing because it's such a massive part of it Sorry. and it's not something that I've ever excelled at in the sense that I've also positioned the press as a quote-unquote European press in in Berlin and that's not how publishing publishing the art world works transnationally and and supra linguistically which is really a nice model but generally speaking literature and, and commercial publishing houses work within language regions you know and 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 there is really a border to the distribution so it's hard to uh, and that's where translation comes in and all these other things so I've, I've kind of found it really difficult to distribute so as a, as a writer I am actually like I would love to ironically look at the possibilities in the future of because it's also I'm getting I'm getting older and tired of, of representation <laughs> with an agent, you know, or, or just generally somebody kind of doing that work of going out and pushing. Put, I mean, Susan, you've always been such a great champion of of not just me, many writers, and in general, like it's just, just such an amazing um, uh, part. You know, and it's something I'm very conscious of to do with the artists and writers that I work with is to try to be that enthusiasm enthusiast and 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 person fighting. You know, in the corner of of writers, especially when, um, uh, like I said, like now there's more more opportunities, I guess, more outlets. Uh, interestingly enough, I, I feel at least. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I I think that's an interesting aspect actually to the unbound model, for want of a better word, is the reader is literally invested in the book, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in in both sense of of. The word and maybe that maybe that's the way forward. Um, John, you described yourself as a European press based in Berlin. I hate to bring up the whole um, maybe the elephant in the room, but Henningham Family Press. <laughs> How much has Brexit thrown up problems for you as a publishing company? <laughs> I, Is that a whole I, other evening? Well, I, I, I yeah. I literally, at the moment, cannot send books to the Republic of Ireland. I've, I've sent books um, and they're arriving or either very late or they're having customs duty applied, even though they're exempt. And each time you send a parcel, you, you're committing to like an hour or two of chasing it up. Just a single book. It's, it's and we're having, we are, we're having trouble with Europe as well. Not very much. Not as much. Not yeah. as much. For some reason, Ireland is really conflicting the system. I don't but, know why. Yeah. I don't know. Are you finding you have trouble sending your books into the UK, John? Or? Yeah, I mean, it was kind of been a weird year. I use my distributor in the UK as Turnaround, and they've always been a good distributor. And it was always automated, and I, I didn't sell a lot of books, but it was always a pleasure to see get automated sales reports. And then, yeah, last year, first with COVID, it just it ceased. Uh, that was also heartbreaking to see that, like, yeah, yeah. just I mean, bookshops weren't open, and and yeah, <laughs> and then I think with Brexit, it's it's kind of created its own its own headaches. Um, so I, I, mean, I NBNI are our distributor and they are able to get things through to shops it seems but they have they're on a bigger scale they've obviously come up with some way around it which is not available to us for direct sales we can't do that mm -hmm. um but 
Um, and you were talking about distribution as well. Our, our you know, sales representation. So we're very fortunate to be with um, Impress Books. And Impress Books oh, yeah. are a group. They bring together 50 or more now independent publishers. And it's a member-led organization. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, you know, uh, and they're, they're a fantastic team and they're absolutely brilliant. So Impress, we can't, I mean, when we... We've been doing what we do for years. Um, in 2018 was when we first started with Pascal O'Loughlin's book, um, Now Leg Warmers, was our first novel. And talking to Pascal about, um, this one is set in Klondorf, Siberia, which is kind of a, his nickname for Klondorf in, uh, in housing development in the 70s. But we joining that up was part of the thing this was our first novel we published and I was like well we have to be able to be represented by sales reps and have people that can take it to bookshops Mm -hmm. and can distribute it in a way that we can't just from our studio because it just wouldn't work otherwise and so impress really made that work um makes a huge difference but as for how Brexit has affected that it's definitely taken a chunk out um, and we don't know when that, I mean, it would be years before they sort this out. Yeah, it's, so, it's very difficult because um, we did a lot of direct sales to Ireland and uh, yeah. it's all, it's, I don't know what's going to happen with We that. also, we, we do, um, we do, uh, you know, we do a lot of performance. Yeah, I mean, we, this year we were invited to go to this, um, to do a, a show. I was absolutely, um, there's a festival called um, Darmstadt, which is kind of a summer school which was that used to be taught by people like, it's a music thing that used to be taught by people like Pia Boulez and um, who's the guy with the, Stockhausen, you know, you know mm-hmm. him. And um, he, yeah, and we were invited to go over to do, um, to teach a class about scores and printing and we were going to do some live score making and stuff like that. And none of that can happen because uh, of COVID, but now, we were going to be doing that before Brexit happened. Now Brexit's happened. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know what the visa situation is like. We don't know so much so we, stuff. It's so we just, think it's still happening. We it's think just, it's still happening. We're just having to wait. And of course, like when people in Ireland buy our books, if they buy them from a normal bookshop or they buy them from, uh, you know, online stores, our books are still getting through. It's just when we sell them. It's just when we send them from our studio. That's when we have problems. Yeah, but, but that's like, also when you make the most money, you know, though, right? Well, yeah, it was. It was good. It was yeah. good. In, terms of, yeah. in terms of cut, like I mean, I often tell yeah, people, yeah, yeah the yeah, best the... way you can support a small press is to buy directly from their online shop. You know, yeah. Um, to try buying direct. If we can't get it to you, yeah, people do now. Just get it from your bookshop. They can get it in got distribution but it's just a pain you know yeah i mean this is a thing that people often don't realize i don't know why but if you go to a bookshop and say order this for me they can order anything <laughs> literally any any bookshop can order absolutely anything you know and they can have it in yeah. there in a couple of days because everyone uses the same the same big distributor we're all, yeah. we're all with gardeners mm-hmm. basically aren't they so yeah ingram gardeners, ingram gardeners yeah. Whoever, yeah yeah so when they say oh we can't get this to you they're lying <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just going to say, um, just Google Broken Dimanche Press, just Google Henningham Family Press and go buy products. Um, I've, I'm have i going to throw a bunch of questions out here because we're running out of time. But this one from Colin O'Shea, um, oh. and it's for all three of you. Um, John, you touched on this briefly before with Fitzcarraldo, but he's asking, and you all decided to set up your own publishing houses, were there any other publishers you were deliberately trying to emulate or, and he says more fun, any that you were deliberately trying to oppose or better? So um, I suppose he's asking who are you against? (laughs) (laughs) Who do you you not want to be? Do you want to go first, John? With <laughs> well, I could just say, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, in the sense that, like, I was so naive and ignorant starting out that I, I don't know. I mean, I like mentioned the ebook thing and commercial publishing, I guess, in general. I, I loved um, the history of Tom McCarthy's Remainder, was published oh, yeah. by Metronome Press, which was a curatorial-led project uh, by Clementine Delis and Thomas Bouteau. And I, I really love the history of this. And it's something that, again, I'm going to go back to, I think, a model where a small press like BDP 
could publish a novel uh, that has like lots of integrity and lots of ambition um, and then try and get it the right reviews and the right audi initial audience and then hopefully pass it over to a, a more uh, bigger press. Uh, so that was definitely an inspiration that I was emulating, a model that I, and I'm going, going to go back to it 10 years later or 12 years later. Um, and yes, so I think that would be my, my succinct answer to that. Now, now so the first uh, models we followed, Hogarth Press, obviously, with the wolves, um, Kelmscott Press, um, William Morris. Making all your stuff yourself, sewing stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, although, yeah, I'll leave that alone. Uh, um, the Danielson family um, were a American band who are all relatives, you know, Daniel Smith. They're and a bit mad. They were, they're a bit mad. They're, we, we got to meet them, um, got to know them through a few years ago. So we were working um, with some guys from Asthmatic Kitty. Yeah. One of the, yeah, he's a music, again, it's a music, music. But, so the, the Danielson family at the time ran a, a, their own music publishing called um, uh, Sounds Familiar. And uh, that Is was a, a new and, no, no, that was that's that's someone else. else. So it Sounds Familiar was a big inspiration. In terms of other presses, when we were doing our fiction list recently, uh, CB Editions, Charles Boyle, um, was a, something that showed that it was possible. Um, we were you... a bit, the thing is, we were trying to be a bit like Charles Boyle because Charles Boyle started his press to show how it should be done. So Charles Boyle was basically against everyone. Yeah, but <laughs> so we were kind of being like Charles Boyle, who's also against everyone. Other <laughs> other debts, so Gally Beggar Press, also who we knew early on, and they were very um, supportive and gave lots of good advice. So mm. yeah. Um, yeah, were... early on, they were. Very influential. Now we're part of Impress Books. We're surrounded by, I mean, so I'm penned in the margins. Tom Chivers, we worked yeah. with as performers. So at we London Word Festival. London yeah. Festival. So penned in the margins was another, um, and we're peers. So we've we've known each other a long time. Before and one of the reasons know. we started the press is because of the Republic of Consciousness Prize, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. We, yeah. Well, we no, we started the press years and years ago, and one of the reasons we've gone more into novels and kind of literary publishing as, as opposed to art or performance publishing which is what we were mainly doing yeah. before and mm -hmm. um, was because of the public or consciousness prize because having a prize for just independent presses meant that there was somewhere to be visible or something to aim for which yeah. makes it a lot more yeah you know, more recently blue moose books they've been um very um mm -hmm. with leonard and hungry ball they've given us lots of uh stuff to emulate and um we were long listed for the Walter Scott Prize partly because of them with uh, we thought of entering it because they did so with um, the Gallows poll um, so th you know there's another press that was very um I think it's so great when like small pre like I mean presses that you've just all mentioned like start to uh, you know Ducks Newbury Port was a great example of basically you yeah. know I mean, generally, there's been loads of examples that that uh, just wasn't there 15. It feels to me, at least, like 15 years ago, uh, it just wasn't mm -hmm. really happening. That you had like Faber and Faber was like this in the, the independent literary, and it had become like ossified, kind of. You know, it had its own, it was its own. It basically was a commercial publisher for all its. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's it's really it's really cool, and I think yeah, the Republic of Consciousness Prize, uh, yeah, it's such a cool initiative. Peep out tree. I'm just going to, oh, yeah, I'm now going to randomly say press names until this is finished. <laughs> <laughs> That's just basically There's awesome. so many of them, aren't there? There's so many of them. We'll be talking about something else in, in yeah. a couple of minutes' time. I'll just be like, oh, another one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, Col let's, let's Colum, look. Colum has just come back to me here and he said he meant all three screens, including Gorse. And I'm not going to oh, say yeah. anything apart from um, it was an intervention and a provocation, but um you can come along on saturday night and hear all about it at, um diva collard's cart horse orchestra um so we're running out of time here now um i'd like to thank uh david and ping henningham for joining us from london and um from henningham family press and john holton joining us from berlin from broken dimanche press thank you everyone for tuning in and it's been an absolute pleasure to host these events. Thank you. Thank you.